So the front door, you know, this is all perfectly good for the, the 1840 period. You know, these latches are good for the 1840 period. I've never seen this done before, so I'm, I would assume this has gotten added in in the 20th century when the knob and, and that lock get added. Yeah, see, we have, this is a, late, a later lock, and, and knob, we've got a hole here, but I'm not seeing good evidence of the original lock anywhere. One thing that's interesting on the house is that all the locks have been switched out on the first floor, actually on the second floor too. Okay. You know, so someone came through, and I thought it might be Mrs. Mealy, but um, someone in the 20th century came through and, and was looking you know, to colonialize it and take it back, to, I think, to what they thought it should be. And you know, this might have been partly because people were assuming this was the house, that you know, the other half of the house burns down, but this is still the 18th century house as opposed to a 19th century house, so we want it to look like an 18th century house. <coughs> so that all of these locks on these other doors, I believe, came from the second floor doors. They're taken okay. off. And so there were mortise locks on all these doors. So what's, you wouldn't, what's a mortise lock? So the, the door is cut here, and you know, most of the locks we have today are mortise locks. The lock goes into the door so you don't see it, rather than being attached the way a rim lock. The carpenter locks are like a rim lock. They're attached on the outside, so you see that. You know. So in the, actually in the 18th century, they start using mortise locks on the finest houses, so that by this time in the 1840s, you know, good houses, everyone wants those mortise locks because then the hardware's hidden. You know, there's that move towards hiding all the hardware as much as possible, so then the mortise lock would be stuck in the door. And you'd expect a mortise lock here because we knew we had them in the, all these other doors. And mortise locks came popular when? Well, they start coming in in the 18th century, but they're, you know, it, they're extremely uncommon then. So in the early 19th century, they, they start becoming more prevalent, and so that's when, you know. Okay. So are you suggesting that is or is not an original lock? I, I don't think this is the original lock, but it's interesting that they didn't put a rim lock here, and I'm, I was looking for good evidence of infill on the door. Could the door have been replaced, or is that the original door? Well, let's see. It could have been replaced. Um, this door's pinned there. It looks like good old hinges, top and bottom. These are <coughs> these are Baldwin hinges, so they're certainly appropriate to the 1840s. Um, the, the hinges upstairs, I think, are car. We can look at some of the other doors here and see. I think, the, uh, I can't remember whether, no, the, a lot of the hinges are Clark hinges. Let's just look at these real quick and see, because, yeah. So these are the Thomas Clark hinges, which is a, you know, a 1840s era hinge as well. Um, and then, so the Baldwins work too, of course, you always have this issue, especially you know, with someone who's collecting antiques. Mm -hmm. If they need hinges, they might go buy old hinges from somebody if, they're, if they have the money and the, you know, they're that obsessed with it. So, so the, let's say that she didn't, uh, so when the fire happened, do you think it could have, it, it brought itself this far over? And I, he replaced these doors with 18? I, the fire happens over there. Over here. I think, uh, I, because this is where the wing is gone. Yeah, well, this is all gone. This was all gone. This is all gone. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have we have pieces of end wall that are are good for the 18th century, but only very small sections. I mean, you can see the end gable end wall up in the attic 
you know, and, and so that's a good 18th century wall. But so you're saying all this all was this gone, gone in the 1840 <clears throat> 1839 fire. All this is gone. There, there's nothing but some pieces of, of exterior wall. So what do you think remains from the original Corbin Lee house? Main, uh, you know, the Harry Dorsey Golf 1775 house. The, the foundation walls, this end wall, and a, a certain, you know, how much exactly of the end wall. For example, we can get under the, I think it's under the porch there. You can see, you can sort of see the line where, as I recall, where the, the old found, old wall was and, and what's, you know, where the new has been pieced into it. Okay. Um, so the, the, the wing, this west wing, those f walls probably mostly survived, you know, somewhere at the top they've come down. But see, and that's why it's, it's hard to get a complete read on that because he rough casted the whole building. And of course he does that because you've got, you know, scorched stone and brick, and then you're piecing in new, and you're probably not going to be doing Flemish Bond, you know, in 1844, because that's, well, you know, it's retarded tear at this point. And so you're going to be doing a different bond. It's going to show terribly. It's, it's fashionable to do a rough cast building anyway, you know. You, you get to this question of, well, why did he even bother saving the little pieces of wall that he did save, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> he, could have, he could have taken it down right to the foundation on this end and, and rebuilt, you know. So the, the Rawlings piece, though, if this is the Rawlings, you said this not. is, it's not. It's 1844. This is 1844, mm -hmm. so this isn't the original mm -hmm. golf. No. All the Rawlings plaster work was lost in the fire. Yeah, this is all Greek Revival plaster work. Yeah. It's, yeah, the family was here at the time, right? So they start, in, in, yes, yeah, they start moving out everything of value down here as, you know, and they're running in as the place is going up. They're running in and, and you know, if there's anyone around, they are coming as well. And, you know, and then you have an issue of um, people coming and stealing stuff, you know, as, as you're rushing and putting it in a pile out there, there are sometimes neighbors who are taking stuff away that's of value that they could use, you know, um, rather than helping to, you know, pull well, stuff out. Well, that would explain the marble fireplace that's documented in his, uh, in his records, <coughs> it's, it's, it's stretching into this room. Yeah, the, the, they are all Greek Revival 1840s okay. mantles, yeah. And the, and the fireplaces too, you know, because if you look, this is all, these are all soapstone, the firebox. Um, there was a soapstone quarry in Marriottsville, and I presume that that's where most of this was coming from. Um, you know, they were shipping it into Baltimore, and then he's probably bringing it from Baltimore out to here to do those fire boxes. Um, typically, you would, you know, you, your brick fire box walls would be rough, would be parged, and the idea of that is, in, you know, the parging protects the brick, so you would never have exposed brick in your fire box. The heat wears out that parging, and you have to periodically replace it. Um, you know, with the soapstone, it's one of the few stones that's good in fire. Um, that's why they use it. And, you know, so you get these nice big pieces of, and it's, it gives you a very finished look, and it doesn't deteriorate the way the plaster would. Okay. So it, that's, that's 1840s. 1840. Mm -hmm. So basically, every, this house is 1840. Yeah. Except for the Eight. foundation, the this wall. wall, this wall survives. Some, yeah, this wall survives up into the, the gable this end. And you can, this well, yeah, I mean, the, the outside walls of the wing here okay. survived, but, you know, all of this is all 1840s too. I mean, this is just a shell. Okay. So he comes through in 1840 
and renovates the wing. And my interpretation was, you know, he needs a place to stay here. So he's, th this is quick and easy for him to do, and they can live here when they're out here, in, you know, as they then get around to rebuilding. rebuilding. Right. And then, you know, the, the two doors on the, the hallway in there flanking the later fireplace, they're interesting because they're, they're exactly where they, you'd want them to be if you were going to build you know, so is, is he thinking that he, you know, in the future, he may add two more rooms onto the other end of the house and, you know, bring it closer to what it was and just never decides to do that, right. you know, decides he doesn't need to or whatever. Um, you know, it's a, that's a possibility. It, that, that room is certainly unusual having those two doorways going out onto a porch and you know there was good evidence underneath that that porch is original to the 1840s mm -hmm. uh, which is unusual yeah I mean yeah, you know we don't right we don't we don't know how high up the walls survived how much they decided they had to take down right. you know and then build on like I said I found those newspaper articles that the one said it was burned down to the ground Mm -hmm. the, the mansion. Mm -hmm. And then I found the other one that's hanging in there, which seems a little bit nicer, if I'd say. <laughs> Part of it was burned right. with, you know, a considerable portion of, because you got to think of all the golf paintings and stuff, you know, a man mm -hmm. of his wealth, he would have had a lot of, you know, there would have been more pictures or paintings, mm -hmm. and they probably went up in the fire is what I'm thinking. Well, those things are of value. So, you know, if you've got that mom and dad's portrait and they're no longer living, that's one of the first things you grab right. and take exactly. out, you know. Yeah. So anything that the family values like that is going to get grabbed and, and taken outside first. So yeah, some of the contents survive, but the house itself, right. no. Yeah, that's I mean, even the floor, all these floors, the floor joists and all, it's, this is all 1840s. Okay. So basically the house burned down to the ground mm -hmm. is what we're yeah. concluding with. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, I went through all the, the inventory of when he rebuilt the house and the carpenter locks, and these are all carpenter locks on these doors mm -hmm. here. So they are, would you say they're original to the 1840, or did someone put those in later? Or no, I, I, think, I think they're original, but we're upstairs. We're upstairs. Yes. Okay. Why, what makes you say that? Because there were, well, let's go... Yeah. <clears throat> I think this door probably will show it. Let's see. Okay, so you can see the seam here. So there was a there was a mortise lock in here. Okay. And yeah, that that door. Yeah, I wasn't seeing a good seam there for it. But all of these doors downstairs have seams for where there was a mortise lock. Um, and then you go to the upstairs doors, which have new locks. They all have um, scars for where there were carpenter locks. So what I think happened was, you know, she sees these and she thinks, these are good old colonial locks, you know, not knowing the carpenter dates to the 1830s, 40s, you know, into the 50s. Um, and so she takes them all down, brings them down here, rips out the, the original locks, probably tosses them, not realizing, you know, they're just the same age, um, and then has to put new locks upstairs. What Ken's saying is that, you know, we're looking in and we're standing in an 1840s house, mm -hmm. not, right. an eight, not a 1775 house. Right. So this house would not resemble what golf necessarily lived in. Right. right. The early golf. Right. Okay. Yeah, the trim work is all different. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah, the plaster. Well, this I know from the 1920s was not here. <coughs> Sibylla came in and she's like, none of this mm -hmm. existed. And then when I brought uh, E. Smith in here, she said um, that her father did all that work. And yeah. she said that he met, messed with the plaster. Because she says she remembers him putting one up. And I go, well, no, I thought that was original to the house. So she goes, well, maybe he may have been restoring it then. So yeah, who it's knows? Possible. at least we know it's not rolling. So. Yeah, 
yeah. It's definitely not Rawlings. Yeah. Okay. It's, um, you know, it's possible that, you know, each of those leaves would have been cast separately and then installed, you know, using wet plaster to, to basically ad adhere it. And so if one of those leaves comes down, they can, you know, recast another and stick it up there. Um, and that may have been what was going on. Um, now, chair rail's not getting used after 1830, you know, so that's, you know, as soon as you see that, you know that this, this is all put in in the 20th century. Yeah, that was 1950, um, yeah. I, I can tell you that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about these mantles? How old do you think these mantles are? You know, I was, I was looking, I, I don't remember on the other one, the, you know, they're very similar. I, I, I um, don't remember that some of the, the decorative work was missing there, and I was looking at it, you know, it looks like it's composition, which, you know, everything about this, though the question is, is this, a, you know, circa 1800, 1810 mantle, or is it a, you know, colonial, very good colonial revival copy? I do know they were here in the 1920s because well, Sayola yeah. remembers them. In the right, this fireplace is, isn't, is put in in the 20th century, you know. So then they bring the mantle in, and the same with that other fireplace that has the matching mantle in the wing. Yeah, the fire the fireplace is all a 20th century addition. Yeah, yeah. There was no heat in this space originally. I think these are probably yes, a, a, an early 19th century mantle that came from a house like in Baltimore that's getting torn down. You know, and there it could have been a house that had double parlors with matching mantles, and they're like, oh yeah, those those are nice. They look they look perfect here. You know. Um, and they bring them in. The other one, you can clearly see the mantle was nailed with big wire nails. Now, it could have gotten pulled off and re-nailed, and they use new nails. You know, and, and, and without really pulling it off and, and examining it, we wouldn't know. Um, but this is pretty good quality work, and actually, we can, do we see some variation in the, yeah, it's hard to see whether it's, whether it's just, Paint buildup has, yeah, and here, you, yeah, you've lost a lot of details, which make you, makes you think that it probably is good. I'm not aware of them using composition ornament in the 20th century. It doesn't mean they didn't. I, I just, I haven't seen it. Um, you know, in the late 19th century, they start doing the, you know, pressed wood details that you'll find on mantles. Um, so I wouldn't expect composition, you know, just a quick look at that mantle when I first came in. I think that's composition ornament there. And it'd be interesting, you know, to, um, I have to get, photograph those details and see. Um, there's a book that was published uh, a few years back on um, Joseph Welford in Philadelphia, who was a composition ma maker, and he, you know, he was one of the major composition makers in the country in the, you know, early, 20, early 19th century. And um, his stuff is um, shipped to all over. Um, so you might find it here, you know, it's possible. There was, there was a composition maker in Baltimore as well. Um, but, you know, you, it's possible we could find those exact patterns you know, amongst his work, um, which would also help to date the mantles. But yeah, I'm you know, I'm pretty sure that these are just brought in. They're brought in in the 20th century, but they're probably yeah, they're probably early 1800s mantles. You know, presumably from a house in Baltimore, because <clears throat> a lot of stuff was getting reused. Because these tiles are probably an 18th century. <clears throat> hearth tile um, that get got reused, you know, it, it's possible they were found around here, you know. Well, I know from the, what the Dunty stories were, like downstairs in the basement, they used to go down to Baltimore and bring back uh, the ballast that they used, the, the stones and all, mm -hmm. and they would bring it up here to lay down in the basement of the, the mansion, because mm -hmm. the 
the mansion they said had a dirt floor. That came from my interviews with family members. It probably actually wasn't ballast. It, it's unusual for ballast to be getting you know, pulled out of the bottles of ships and reused. A lot of, a lot of the Belgian block street paving, mm -hmm. people always call it ballast, and it wasn't, you know, it was, it, there, you know, there, was, there were granite quarries, for example, there was a granite quarry in Ellicott City that was producing Belgian block and shipping it into Baltimore to pave the streets there. You know, and of course, then in the 20th century, they're yanking up all of that and you know, starting to put down asphalt. And a lot of Belgian block becomes available then, and people are taking it. You know, and there's just this story that it's ballast, but it's not. Is there any reason why the walls would have been a foot thick here and not in the wing? Why he would have chosen to do that, or is that a cost-saving measure, or? Um, it's, I mean, it, well, you know, this is, so he creates a bearing wall here. Um, I'm not sure where you're saying they're not, because the wall between. Well, when you get upstairs to the second floor, the walls are almost like half the size or paper thin is, you know as Sibylla used to call it. She's like, she used to call it the cheap side of the house. Oh. Huh. Because the walls like here are like a foot thick, but when right. you get up to the second floor. Well, they're thinner here because of course this is a frame wall, not a masonry wall, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a frame wall. So it's, it's thinner than that wall. Um, yeah, you gotta understand, I have no idea what I'm talking okay. about, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just okay. saying what's yeah. been told to me. Right. And, well, you know, you, that's why you're here. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I I need to go up and look at that wall to see. Um, because it's such it's, a hodgepodge, the house. You know what I mean? With, you know, like when you go in, into like Hampton, it's all symmetrical. You know, everything's balanced. Mm -hmm. and here, you got doors here, doors there. Right. Doors well, here. because you you only have half of Hampton here. That's the problem, you know. If you had the other half, then you'd have a couple of, of rooms that on that side that would balance these couple here. You know, the difference is where, the way he sticks the stair in here, mm -hmm. you know, instead of like at Hampton, you'd ha you have the stair between two rooms, you know. Um, now, do you think something like that would have been similar for the time here? A staircase that was more elaborate. Well, you mean f for the original house? The um, it, it, I couldn't find any evidence, you know, mostly because everything's burned, of of where the stair probably was. You know, it's certainly possible. You know, plenty of people put their stair out in this center passage, um, so you, it wouldn't be surprising to find it out here, but then you get grand houses like Hampton, you know, where they're tucking it away so that they're leaving this, you know, as, as a, you know, more formal space, you know, this is like the new salons are, they're becoming popular late 18th century here, so all the molding is good 1840s Greek revival stuff. All the, and what type all of wood the, would that be? It's probably just pine. Just pine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, it could very well have um, been taken right off of the Perry Hall lot, you know, wood lot, mm -hmm. and sawn up, um, and then, you know, then hand planed. Yeah, the plaster cornice is all 1840s. Um, so that is 1840s. Yes. We have decided it is 19, well, the or 20th century. 20th. Yeah, the fireplace. fireplace. Yeah. The fireplace. Is yeah, the mantle's 1800s just yes. put here. But yes. right. And how That's do we how do, and how do we know that it's 1800 just by the design? The, yeah, the design of it and 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 construction. I think the other one uh, we can go in and look at the other one. I think the other one you can see where it's pinned together. That's my recollection. Yeah, let's go see that real quick. Um, <clears throat> oh. and that 
that's nail. So maybe we can't. But they both appear to be the same mantle, right? Yeah. Design-wise and everything. Yeah, I, th I think they're completely identical. identical. Right. Um, and I don't think I have any... There's no record in his book of purchasing these mantles, just the marble ones. So it, it's all adding up. Yeah, because this fireplace is also added in. It is. Yeah, this is a 20th century add-in. Okay. For this. And how do you, can you tell that? Um, there's a couple things that, um, you know, just the, the construction of it and um, the way the, um, I, think, I think the biggest clue was in the, um, up in the attic where the, it um, punch, punches through, I, okay. you know, and it's not tied in to the others. Um, I think that was the, the evidence that we found up there that, that you know, pretty much clinched it. Um, yeah, and Gordon yeah, Smith did this. Um, he did the bathroom and the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I know that for sure. And then the other thing they did is this crosseting. You can see the original edge of the, the architrave here, you know, so then they bumped this out to make this look more yeah, more 18th century. Yeah. Uh, Sibylla told me there was a dumbwaiter here. Hmm. Oh, you, you can see it better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When she came in, she toured, she said there used to be a dumbwaiter that came from the basement up here. Interesting, because we have that the kitchen fireplace down there. Yes. You know. But when, which, you know, that raises an issue here too, because there's a, there was a fireplace here incredible you know stack of masonry here coming all the way over but you know it's coming behind the bathroom here and i th yeah it comes all the way out to here this is so yeah so you know this is the other end of that and <clears throat> so that's you, the whole fireplace from downstairs that's the well, you, ha you have the flue from the fu big fireplace downstairs coming up through here, but you don't need this much. So there has to have been another fireplace in here that's gotten covered over when, you know, when they put the bathroom in, something like that. Yeah, so it, yeah, to, to strip out that bathroom and find the and old fireplace would be interesting. Original, um, that would have heated this room, maybe? Well, yeah, it... it Presumably heated that room, but um, in, it's it's a it's such a big stack that it, you wonder if I mean it's it's a it's a it's a it's a much bigger stack than any of the other fireplaces down here. So was there a cooking fireplace up at this level as well? You know, so that you know in the winter they may have been cooking here. In the summer to keep the heat out, they might have been cooking down below. You know. That's, in yeah, in the 1840s, the yeah. 1840s, so mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's no way of knowing without opening that up and finding the old yeah. fireplace. See, she put, firebox. there's a carpenter <coughs> line, there's no hole for the mm -hmm. lock. So, yeah. yeah, that goes to reinforce what you were saying before, that that was added on later. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what exactly this was, that was going on here in the plan. Yeah. Was it just the 50s and they were just uh, yeah. going for that modern? I don't know whether they were going for the modern look. It's possible. Or, or whether they, I mean, is there a bathroom upstairs? And did, so they, the, the, all the plumbing may be in there. And that was their way of, rather than just boxing it, you know, this is a more stylish treatment okay. for boxing in pipes. So if the fire didn't penetrate that wall because we still have, uh, you know, the evidence of the original roof lining in the attic. So do you think this is the, this is original to... All 70? this, all this got completely gutted. This is got, gutted mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think what happens, the fire may very well have started over here. Really? But the, yeah, but the wind's blowing that way. 
So it, it's everything downwind from where the fire starts that really gets wiped out. If the fire had started at that end, this end likely would, would not have burned unless you had the wind blowing from the east, which generally you don't. You know, it's rare instances that you have that. So if the fire had started at the east end of the house, most likely this end would have survived. And this is December we're talking about, yeah. December 13th. So, and if they were cooking over here, since we have evidence of the stove downstairs, that would make more sense. You know, you could have had an overseer here, but he would have had his own house. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what would have triggered the fire, do you think? Well, I th they, they were probably here. I think they must so have been. They yeah, I think they were, they were living here at the time. They could have come out. You know, they usually by December, you're moving back into the city, but you know sometimes people were staying out until after Christmas and then going in. Okay. Um, I mean, unless that family at that time did they not have more than one home? The care I don't I don't know much. I didn't research much on okay. Harry Dorsey Golf Carol. When I, it, when I it, think if it didn't pertain to this house, I didn't research. I didn't go back that far. My recollection is that he had a house in Baltimore. Most you know, them, which yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and so it would. You know, that helps to explain why he's bringing craftsmen from Baltimore out mm -hmm. to build this rather than just using local guys. I mean, that's one reason, you know, he knows people there. Mm -hmm. um, he's there in Baltimore a lot of the time so he can contact. And it, it appeared to, that he acted as, as his own general contractor. Mm -hmm. This is, this is the, the end of the tenon for this rail, right? So this is construction. This is not the you know, evidence of the mortise, mortise lock, you know. Okay. These are the tenons coming through. You can even see there's the wedge. Okay, I don't to, understand to, that. Okay, so when they construct this door, <coughs> you know, they, they are in this, this style, they are cutting a, a hole in it, and then the end of this rail is being cut down so that you have a little pocket here that, that this, the end of this rail, this tenon on the end of the, this rail, goes into the pocket or the mortise mm -hmm. in, in this style. You know, so that's holding it together. Then you drill a hole through them and you put a wi wooden pin in there okay. to hold it together gotcha. tight. Okay, So they've, they've cut the mortise all the way through so that the tenon comes through and then to help t keep that joint tight, you know, because this will keep it tight to a certain extent, but you can make it even tighter by cutting a little wooden wedge and driving it in and then sawing it off flush. And then, um, you know, that, that just keeps this from working loose as you're, you know, keeps, this is all, you know, you've got one, two, four, six, eight, you know, 10 mortises and tenons to join this whole door together. Well, you potentially have more than that because these sometimes, you know, will, will often be, even though they're not pinned, they could still be mortised and tenoned. So yeah, at each of these joints. But all of these joints are pinned and these probably have two, sometimes as many as four pins to them. So even these smaller doors then, you're saying they're also 1800s or? 1840s, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, almost all of these doors are 1840s. You know, there are probably a couple of exceptions. I'm not seeing good evidence here, but because this is the wing, we could have, you know, since this is more, most likely a service space, mm -hmm. it'd be m more common to see the carpenter locks, rim locks on this door and not the mortise locks. Really, why is but, well there, that little action. So well, unfortunately, we can't, we've lost the, well we, we haven't lost, we've hidden, they've hidden the evidence for what was here okay. on this side because they put this little panel, yeah, they did that on covered that, that. yeah, oh, they, so <coughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, if you were gonna restore this, you wanna pop this piece off gotcha. and most likely you have panels just right. like oh. that on the other side. What's the purpose of putting the paneling on? Well, you know, it's, 
it, it's probably your 1950s sleek look is what they're going for. You know, they're using a the flush core door for the new bathroom in there, along with all this dental molding. This is not 1840s, this is 20th century. You know, part of the colonial revivalizing okay. that's done here. Would these have been like servant stairs? Or yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember seeing that. Yeah, Debbie was thinking that was like a door pulley to close the door. Yeah. Like would it I hook so. here and then yep. it would close the door? It might have automatically closed it. That's interesting because I don't remember well, seeing were, that yeah. when I was here if 14 years ago. Then, right? if, uh, once upon a time, if they did most of their, the servants did most of their stuff in the Down basement, below, right. Their yeah. hands would be full so that right. as soon as they open it, it shuts behind them. Right. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it, it, ideally, you know, it's for the family living up here to keep all that noise you know, down, you want to keep that door down. The servants probably aren't even bothering with it. Well, you know, the question is, is this actually an 1840s piece or is it more modern? More modern, yeah. Um, Would you have bothered if it was more modern, though? Well, yeah, I, yeah. That's, a, that's a good question. You have, would you I'm have? I'm thinking, you know. Um, because it, you, you would think if, the, if you wanted it there, you know, in the in the 20s and later you do have these springs that you can put on the doors yeah. that automatically you know swing them closed um, so this is kind of like an earlier version of that I think and this this hardware here although it's heavily painted so it could just be just you know thick paint but it looks like it is wrought iron piece so that would date it back. Yeah, that would that would definitely date it back to. And is that then unusual? 1840s period. I would say yes because I've never seen one before. Um, you know, in okay. in 30 years of looking, you know. Well, that makes it's, this, that that's, one piece that, that makes this house. That's very. It's very unique. cool. Yes, it's very what cool to see. That, that we think this is 1840s, and. Original. <clears throat> yeah, so this is an original way, door. right, okay. to, to presumably to automatically shut the door and that, you know, so you would think there'd be a, a um, it would be a pulley there, right? Pulley prob pulley. Well, there, there's probably, right, probably a weight so that, mm -hmm. so that you probably have a cord, yep. you know, coming over here and then, you know, around this one and then over top of this one with a weight hanging down here that would automatically pull the door okay. shut. And then you you know you wonder whether is there any evidence of the weight scraping here, the the whitewash on this wall is just all peeling off. So it's it's yeah it's you know if it if it's been rubbing long enough you get this you know you could get this little cupping in the plaster. The that the that paint wouldn't even hide, but. Assuming that it, you know, the floor wasn't sticking at all at that point, yeah, you probably. It was, you, you know, I, I would think they'd been using a sash weight like you'd see in the windows. Um, and I think these windows probably had yeah. sash weights. Well, you know, they, they're typically a square. And they can be, you know, the, the size varies based on the weight of the window sash, but, you know, they're often that long, you know, and you can get them bigger, you can okay. get them bigger around, too, for, um, and uh, we can take a quick look at the window sash and see, I think they, my recollection is that they had, these were hung on weights. They wouldn't have had yeah, that. Yeah, it was a mortar, and then they put the, well, because there's no reason okay. for a skeleton key if you have a. Automatic. Well, well, now, well, if you have the carpenter lock, right? It doesn't go through, right? It just unlocks the box, correct? Yeah, but, but if you were unlocking from this side, you've got to go through uh, the door. Gotcha. Um, and that would be the case even with a mortise lock, you know, that you want to have access usually from both sides. And then um, you, you would still have, you know, those skeleton keys with the mortise locks. 
Although, if it, if it does shut enough that it locks, you'd still have to use the knob, mm -hmm. which is interesting. There's somewhere in here, there's an elbow latch. I forget now where it is. Um, but this is where you'd expect to see it, because if you're coming up with your hands full, right. you want that elbow latch here to be able to then push, and then you let it go, and, and it closes shut. But I, I think this lock has not been fiddled with. I don't, you know, again, you, because this is the service end of the house, you, you're more likely to see the carpenter locks here, not the mortise locks. They're just out for show in, in your best rooms. Because these are huge sash. Yeah, we have pulleys up there. You know, given the size, you, you'd figure these had to have been hung on weights. Yeah, they've been painted over, and then, of course, there are no cords anymore, but they would have come down. And then there, you know, there would have been like hemp and rope coming down attached to the sash here. You can feel there's a little groove cut out on the sash. If you look up here or feel up there, you can see that, that oh, yeah. Yeah. right down in here is the groove so that it, it goes down and then they are just nailing it to the side of the window sash. And then of course back in the box here is where the weights are. And they've now probably dropped down because the, the cord's broken. Um, but then usually there's, um, if you lift this up, the, you'll see the, um, you know, there's a piece of wood there that you can pull out to get access into the weight to replace the cord. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you, you know, they, it could be screwed or nailed in, but if you open this up, and I don't think we can, but, uh, hey, we can. We should be able to see. Because you don't want, yeah, it's, it's sticking, so. And I'm not seeing the seam here for it, so it, it possible it's up higher. But typically, you know, there's just a little, you know, it's a, like a wood patch cut in there that covers the box, and then, it, you know, you take that off and it's open inside. It's, they're pretty cool because... <sighs> You know, you have sash weights for both this inner sash and the outer sash. And the boxes will often have a little piece of wood that separates it so that the two sash can't get, or the sash weights can't get tangled at all. So they're in separate little boxes and then there's, you know, you can get to it by like, I've seen them where they, they have a little hole cut in that little piece of wood that separates the two and you can slide it up to get to the, you know, because if you open this, you'd get to the sash weight that's for this lower sash, and then you slide open that little box, and you can get to the sash weight that's for this outer sash, upper sash. Um, Let's head on upstairs. Okay. So we're saying this is 1840s, right? Yes. The actual structure wall, the walls and yes. all that. Okay. Yeah. Because the first thing Sibylla said when she came in here, she was like, what happened to the fireplace? And I'm like, I have never seen a fireplace in here. And she's like, no, there was a fireplace right here. And then if you come here, mm -hmm. you can see the cut out the floor. Mm -hmm. And you can see that's masonry, yep. Mm -hmm. So why it was removed, I don't know, but. Yeah, that's a good question. Unless it was collapsing. Because, well, in a sense, it's not really removed. It's just covered over, you know. So now we need to get the pry bar out and expose it. Well, a body could fall out for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> now, the closets, do you think they would have been original? Actually, I'll take a look at that because I think it was. I mean, this mantle is good for the 1840s. Fireplace looks good for the 1840s. We have a good pressed brick in the fireplace. Um, from here, let's get a look at them. The inside. Yeah, yeah, they're Thomas Clark hinges. The door is pinned together. Yep, that looks like that's good for 1840s. Now, yeah. was that so odd it, to have closets in 1840? No. No? Okay. No. <clears throat> they're, you know, 
they're coming in more and more, and um, so, f you know, for a grand house like this in the 1840s, it's not unusual to have closets. Because um, I always thought, um, like, you know, I always compare everything to the Hampton. I think they always use, like, armoires and, and mm -hmm. cabinets and stuff, and they never had built-in right. closets. And, and, you know, you're still using them in this period as well, but, yes, closets become, built-in closets become much more common in the 1840s, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Sibylla, like I said, she always referred to this as the cheap side because the walls were so thin and, it's a, you know. That's a standard wall thickness, though. It's, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, that's probably, you know, it's between five and a half and six inches thick, I'd say, so that's, yeah, that's, that's standard, yeah. I was wondering if maybe we had board walls in some of these rooms. What, on this end. what do you mean you know, by board walls? Vertical boards that, you know, would be an inch thick board, okay. typically with a bead on it. And, you know, that would be the wall, okay. um, but not here, not even, yeah. You know, and this was probably a room for kids. You know, it's, it's heated, you have the closet, so, um, even though it is at the service end of the house yeah. up here, um, you know, you, it's probably designed for kids. The same with this one, you know, because yeah, we know we had a fireplace there, even though we don't anymore. And then this closet looks, yeah, the door looks good. That's the closet. Two. Um, interesting is why do we have two? But we do. Yeah, that looks like it's the Thomas Clark hinges. Now, when you that say oh. Thomas Clark hinges, is that is that a type <coughs> or is that a brand? It's a brand. It identifies to the 1840s. Yeah, I, th I think th there, it's a longer period than the 1840s. But um, around here, it just seems like, you know. Knowing what we know. <clears throat> yeah, the, well, the, the Clark hinges, you can find them into the 1850s here. But you, I guess I've seen them maybe into the early 1860s and that. You know, and they might be late 1830s, so, you know, 30s to 60s, and that's it. Um, and same with the Baldwin hinges that we saw downstairs. I guess that was the front door had the Baldwin hinges, you know, and they're stamped Baldwin. Um, and they date to? The same 1830s to 60s period, yeah. Um, there's also somewhere in here um, William Carr hinges made in Philadelphia, and I think they have a narrower date range, mm -hmm. you know, which is 1840s. Mm -hmm. you know. Was it insured, and do we know what company it was yeah, insured with? Know. Yeah, I don't, don't recall. It did not, I, it did not even occur to me to, to even know that. Um, yeah, you know. I, was, I was just talking to someone yesterday, yes. and this man was from Philadelphia and he insured his property with a Philadelphia company and the records are still there. So I just sent to them for copies of the records from the 1840s and it, it includes, you know, yeah, they still have them. Um, and and I, I think they're now at the Historical Society, but um, it includes a, a little sketch plan of the house um, and then a description of the details of the house, um, and and they you know they go down to like um, you'll see in the basement this this house has um, counter ceiling in it, and that that house had counter ceiling, and he meant the the insurance agent mentions that the house had counter ceiling in it. So, you know, if you're rebuilding it, you know you don't see counter ceiling done out in the country on, on your typical farmhouse. To find it here, that helps to give you a clue that he had builders coming in from Baltimore, you know, because that's where they're typically doing it. Okay. Um, and in that insurance document, they mention that the counter ceiling was to cut down drafts. He specifically states that in the okay. document, you know. 
which is great. Um, because there's always been this, this back and forth about is it, is it for insulation and, and cutting down drafts or is it for fireproofing, you know? And here you'd think, oh, it's fireproofing, you know? He just, he's rebuilding, you know? He wants to do whatever he can to protect the house. Um, but according to that Philadelphia agent, yeah, it's, it's for cutting out drafts. Yeah. You wouldn't be a bit surprised to find that both the old house could have been insured and if you could find that old record, that'd be incredible, you know. And then this house. Well, see, the question becomes, the, the who is the insurance company and do, you know, do those records survive? So, for example, the, um, the equitable insurance company in Baltimore, those records survive. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, they did not insure anything outside of Baltimore. So... You know, but, you know, he could have been sitting on the board. He could have convinced them, yeah, you know, I, will, I want my country house as well as my city house right. insured and, you know, yeah. Um, they, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you may have to just go hunting for those records. So you think this was probably added when? 50s? Well, yeah, the bathroom, well, although... It could have been added much sooner than that. Uh, you know, one, there's one question that I don't remember even um, really exploring would be the, you know, did he have piped water here in, you know, in the 1840s? They were starting to do that that early. Um, so, you know, there could have been a cistern in the attic um, that they would have pump, pumped water up to the cistern and then piped it, and they could have piped it, you know, both down to a bathroom and down to the kitchen. Um, so you'd expect that it would have been up in this attic up above here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, and there could be pipes in the wall that at this point we don't know about. Um, there was there were call bells. You know, there's some of the the call bell system survives in the basement. Here? Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there, the, um, the cranks are there underneath of a couple of the fireplaces, you know, so the wire, the, there would have been a crank up on the, the jam of the fireplace mm -hmm. with a wire going down in the wall to underneath, and then, it, uh, you know, in the basement it's all exposed, and, you know, so it comes down to a crank that would turn it, you know, make it to make a 90 degree turn for the wire to another crank to make another 90 degree turn and then, you know, presumably carried out to the, the kitchen in okay. the basement <clears throat> that where the rack of bells would have been. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, there, you know, it's only a little bit of that that survives. So there's a lot more that needs to be explored to figure out that whole system. But, okay. but yeah, there would have been a call bell system here. From the beginning. Now, is that a cutout right there? Or yes. So. And there's a cutout here. So. Sorry, Daddy. That's. Okay. Well. It's okay. <coughs> it's okay. It doesn't match it. It looked like it would have been. Oh, you're saying this? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were talking about moving the carpenter locks around. I was just now I'm looking right. to see if there's clues. Of right, the and that that is very likely a clue of where a carpenter lock and the strike plate were and then they pulled it out and then just cut a bigger patch than what the strike plate was most likely. Now is there a reason Because you can see you can faintly see the line where the carpenter lock was coming here oh, yeah, and up absolutely. here. Yeah. Absolutely. Presumably that's where the knob went right so through it. Why yeah. So why would they use mortise locks downstairs and keep the carpet? Whereas carpenter locks considered less. They're less. Yeah, they're less fancy. Less fancy. Be mm -hmm. oh, okay. be because they're visible. Okay. You know, so you're you're moving to you, you want to be as refined as possible. So the hardware being exposed doesn't seem very refined. Okay. So you bury that lock in the door 
and where you don't see it. See, that would be yeah. more impressive to me now. <laughs> it makes it's, sense. Everything you're making, you're saying yeah. makes so much it's, sense. We think we we typically think completely differently from the way they were yes. thinking. You often get people, you know, why would they cover up the brick? You know, they'll they'll pull the the plaster off to expose the brick. You know, no one was doing that in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Anybody can have exposed brick. Covering it with plaster and then an expensive paint or wallpaper, that's what you want, you know. Um, people also complain, you know, why are the wide floorboards up in the attic? I want those beautiful wide boards down on the first floor, you know. No. They want the narrower boards, you know. Those narrower boards are more expensive mm -hmm. because you've got to cut them up sure. into smaller pieces, you know. It's um, all about so, showing your wealth. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Getting the best. Yep. You know, and so you're putting your money on the first floor right. and you're putting your cheaper carpenter locks up right. on the second because floor. Not many yep. people, again, <coughs> very many visitors would be up on your second mm -hmm. floor. <coughs> so we don't know if this would have been an original bathroom or just another bathroom. Well, or yeah, <coughs> certainly that tub is not 1840s, it's much yeah. later. But, you know, <coughs> there, right, there is a possibility that they could have had a bathroom here um, as early as the 1840s. Um, kind of you know, it's, it, you tend not to see it in country houses, it tends to be more in city houses. And I always thought this was odd, the steps, but. Well, because this step is cut through, these step, and the, this doorway is cut through to this room. Yeah. There, there was originally, you know, that was a closet there, so there's no communication between that bedroom and here. Okay. So, it's so yeah, so they, they've, they've reconfigured the step most likely in order to be able to get both up into the attic and over into that other room. Okay. So the bottoms, the bottoms of the steps here are probably, you know, completely wrong. The interesting thing is we have cut nails here on this board. So... Whenever this was done in the 19th century, this isn't, you know, this board is put down in the 19th century, and presumably the, you know, the next step down is there. So this is probably done, which makes you think these stairs are done and the doorway cut through, you know, in the 19th century, um, and not not 1950s like. <clears throat> because you got brick here, and that's stone. That's, that's I think that's brick. I think it's just, this is, it's fire damaged. So it's fire damaged brick. Mm -hmm. So we can agree that this is the original This is, wall. yes, this is, this is an 18th century Flemish bond brick wall. Yeah. So this and then is all course, that's left of Harry Darcy <coughs> Golf. Right. And, right. and <coughs> so this is the, the scar of where the original wing roof was Correct. you know so it's only that high it's shorter than it was yes than it is now but this would have been an original exterior wall right to the original mansion right yeah so then you you know this is all plaster the the brick wall was plastered originally mm -hmm. you know so you, this the attic so the wing is a one and a half story with a finished you know, half story attic and originally, originally yeah, in in the eighteenth century <clears throat> up until eighteen thirty nine. And then the, so then the collar beam for the rafters is coming across here and that's where they make the ceiling at this point. So then you would have had this, you know, probably inaccessible crawl space up in the attic of the wing. So what are you standing so in front of? This, this, is, this is a chimney stack from, from the original house, I'm thinking. But let's take a look at it and see. Well, see here, yeah, it's, so it's rebuilt. This is, this is our Flemish Bond 18th century brickwork here. When you say Flemish bond, what is, is okay. that a, like a type of brick or is yeah, it a no, seal? It, it's, it's a pattern, brickwork pattern, you know, so when they're laying bricks in the wall, they're, you know, you have to, you have to lay bricks, uh, you want to break up the, the joints, the vertical joints, mm -hmm. 
and you have to tie the bricks together, the bricks that are on the outside of the wall with the bricks to the inside of the wall. Okay, okay so you, you'd lay a brick like this, uh -huh. you know, and then you lay a brick going back into the wall so that if you have, you know, you have a brick here and you have a brick behind it like that, you've got this seam and the, you know, these, this brick on the outside could peel away. In order to tie it together, you turn a brick the other way. Okay. okay. So it's a style so, brick laying. It's a, yeah. That's what Flemish, Flemish bond, bond is. Flemish bond is a style of brick laying. Okay. Bonding. You know, <coughs> of bonding it together. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Bonding all the bricks together. So you see it here on this wall. So, so Flemish bond is, okay, the long brick is called a stretcher. The short end of the brick is called a header. Okay. And the, so with Flemish bond, you're alternating stretcher, header, stretcher, header. And then on the row above, you're alternating. But you, to break, break up, up the lines above the header, you put a stretcher. Stretcher, header, stretcher, header. Okay. That, <laughs> I'm getting so much out of this. Like, it's perfect. And what's, there's a little hole there too. Right by the top of the step. Well, that's probably cut out in order to take the header gotcha. for the end of the stairway. Just like they cut out, well, here. You know, that, this was a solid brick wall, and then they, to put this purlin in to support the roof framing here, they cut that out. And it's interesting because there's not much. They didn't even cut it out that deep. That's barely hanging on. I think the brick here is cracked because of the weight of it. The beam? The beam, yeah. The weight. Oh, I see what you're saying. See I that can see it clearly from here. Right there. It's like just a piece of wood just yeah. jammed in there. Fortunately, I mean, you know, because you've got this brace here taking the end, so the weight of the roof is coming onto here. It's getting transferred down the brace to this post, which comes down to here, you know, this this piece is then carrying the weight over and but wait it would also carry the weight down you've got a wall under here you know the question becomes how strong is that wall was it meant to be a load-bearing wall it kind of is now um, but but it's kind of you know this is classic overbuilding and thank God for it because you know then when something like that happens, the house doesn't suffer catastrophic failure, you know, because there's so much else going on up here that can take that. Anyway, coming back to this. <coughs> so there's the line, and we have the Flemish bond on this side of the fireplace, and we don't have it here. This is all, you know, the wall cracked here, apparently, or it was in, the brick was in bad enough shape that they felt they couldn't reuse it in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. So that section of the wall survives to here, and then this is all taken down and rebuilt. All would there this. be a reason why they would rebuild it, though? It, or either, just let it go since it's in the attic now? I, well, see, again, here, oh, we've yeah, got, it we've got this. Up. Yeah. Okay. So we have, we have Flemish bond here, and then like this, this whole end of the... Uh, of the gable apparently collapsed and had to get rebuilt in the fire. So this is, I believe, this is the fireplace that gets added in, in the, down in the kitchen. We were looking at the, okay. that second wood, the, the Adam-esque mantle. From the that, original house? <clears throat> no, this is, this is um, down in the kitchen we have we were looking at that wood mantle yes. that that's the early 19th century yep. matches the one in the front passage yep. and i had said that the the fireplace there had been added mm -hmm. um, so then this is this is this is that the chimney stack for that fireplace it is interesting that that is tied in there Trying to remember, and that is tied in. So actually, that does suggest that the fireplace was here from the beginning. Well, from
from the 1840s. It's, it's built in from the 1840s, so the f I have to look at the fireplace again downstairs. But it look, you know, that's suggesting that that fireplace in that kitchen room was was there. Well, I, I I think what they're doing is there's a chimney stack, a flue on the other side. Oh, they're feeding off. And of it. and yeah, I think they're just tying it back in. Okay. And it yeah, it, so if it if it had been exposed, they would have been corbeling the brick back to okay. to create a weather for the rain to come off of it. If we could get inside, we'd probably see that the flue is corbeled here to come back in. Of course, this is never going to be exposed, so they don't have to do, yeah. right. And that, but this was always exposed, so you can see they use, have a nice grapevine strike to the joint here. You know, see that little, so when they're laying the brick, they're coming back and pointing it up, and they're using a little grapevine tool, and striking across there and yeah leaving that so that it, you've got a nice looking brickwork and then over here when they built it up they literally just took stone yeah, and exactly that the you know so we have an, an 18th century brick chimney that survived there yeah as you can see the burn marks and, yeah know. and and you can see the the ridge line for the original right. wing so everything above that of course was exposed in the 18th century cuz that's above the kitchen the basement cooking fireplace okay. and then of course you can see that they've added onto the left an extra flue and that that flue may be for the fireplace that I'm assuming is behind the the bathroom yeah. in in that kitchen area so the question is is that stonework 18th century or is it 19th century rebuild well, I'm thinking that when he raised the roof, then... Yeah, that you're right. He, he because just, because we have yeah. the roof line here, so all of this stonework yeah. here... He raised the roof, and he just used <coughs> rubble or whatever mm -hmm. he could find Yeah. to fill in the gap. Yep. And then covered it with stucco, because that looks... With that hole right there, that takes you almost right out to the wall. No, that, right? that, that wall... No. Mm -mm. Yeah, that stone wall has to be at least 14 inches thick. Typically you're going to find 18, but it could be um, it could be only 16 inches. So is that shoddy work or do you think that was just get it done quick and cheap? The hole? The, no, the, the, the stone and the just adding the stone. I mean, do you think I, that's something he encouraged to get just I, get it done or well, um, do you think it, you know, it's the attic it, anyway? It's certain, cares? you know, it, I, it depends upon how easily he could acquire the stone, you mm -hmm. know, where it's coming from. It, you know, it's possible that, well, it's just easy because he has it available, but if he knows that he's going to be rough casting the house from the beginning, what's the difference if he builds in stone yeah. or brick? Yeah, and I don't recall now was whether there was any evidence of stone in the walls of any part of the original house. Um, because I know that Gordon Smith, he, when he built, the, you know, because when he finished the barn house, <coughs> and even um, the well out here, all that stone was from the property. I guess they used the brick to give you more of a sharper edge, right? Yes. And then stone but, to fill in everything else. Mm -hmm. Now the darkness <coughs> of the, the the beams here. Oxidation of the wood. Okay. Over a hundred. So it's not fire or years. smoke or no. anything damaged or no. treated. I mean, there could be a little bit of soot in here that escaped from the you know, fireplace did tell crack. Me it, it was struck by lightning twice. Huh. The house. It looks like a rock nail as well. All, this one is cut all the way around. Yeah, so they're, you know, to hang up stuff, you know, they could have been hanging up, you know, herbs to dry, other things. But the, it's interesting, you know, it's a 19th century, you know, this is an 1840 beam, and they're using some cut nails from the 1840s, but they're also using some wrought nails. Which How can you tell the difference? Okay, so the cut nail, let's see, here, this is a good example of cut nail. So, you know, it's it's regular and square mm -hmm. in the shank and then it has this kind of squared flat head. Mm -hmm. um, 
That's so the, 1840s? Yeah. So the, the cut nails are made from a plate of iron and you know they're cutting the plate and they, the, the, the plate is set at a slight angle to the blade so okay. that one end of it, the nail is wide and the other end comes to a somewhat of a point, okay. you know. Then the machine hand, um, the machine heads the nail, you know, flattening it and you get, so you get this flat kind of square profile. Mm -hmm. With the earlier nails like this, um, you, you have a, um, um, a square shank, mm -hmm. except that it, you know, it tends to be kind of irregular because it's hand hammered. Gotcha. Um, with a wrought nail, it's hammered to a point on four sides, whereas a cut nail, if we pull this out, we'd mm -hmm. see that it, it, it only tapers to a point on two sides. Gotcha. And the other two sides, it's the same thickness of the, the plate that it was cut out of. Okay. And then they hand make this head, right? So they heat the end of the nail, you know, the blacksmith ha heats it and then hammers it to form that irregular head. Okay. This is, you know, a lot of time they're called rose heads because they're faceted, so they're, you know, there are four facets to a nail head, mm -hmm. a wrought nail head. This is not a good example of it, and none of these nails really has a, has a really good rose head to it to, to really show okay. it, but that irregularity of the, the head, you know, okay. tells you that's a wrought nail. Uh, the, the roof structure is amazing here, you know, to have, amazing how. To have these large purlins, you know, they're, you know, this whole, it's all to support the center of the, these rafters because you have a long enough span that, uh -huh. you know, s to keep the roof from bowing down, they've got this large structure in here and then you know to put in all of the posts and the braces in order to really I mean the roof's not going anywhere mm -hmm. you know, classic overbuild to it and can, the the wood itself is is hand what do you call it it is hand hewn hand, yeah. hand hewn mm -hmm. in the you know in the 1840s you were getting sawn lumber right you know but it's typically smaller stuff that's getting sawn so, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be unusual to find braces that are sawn, but these longer timbers, they're kind of too big to get onto the sawmill carriage at that time to, um, so they're, they're still hewing all that stuff. Yeah, and so, Sean, this, this, yeah, this is a mortise and tenon joint, just like we were talking about in the door. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's a tenon on the end of this, going up into a mortise cut into this piece. You can see part of the mortise right there. So they've, gotcha. they've, they've stuck what looks like a wedge in there. So this, this ten, the tenon on this doesn't go up, continue up in an angle the way the brace does. It actually comes straight up. And it, let's see if we can see it in here. Uh, I think it's about here, and it, so it's probably coming up about that far, and then, you know, it could be coming straight over, it could be coming at an angle too. It'd be interesting to look at these, yeah, see this one has that wedge too, so they, they may have cut the mortise a little bit big in able to be able to work the tenon up into it easily and then they just stick that wedge in there to help make it tight. Usually you're not seeing wedges in, you know, in heavy timber framing like this. Yeah, so it's a cast iron lock. You know, so it's similar. Mm -hmm. um, and this one's smaller because it's, it's a little bit bigger than a cabinet lock that you'd see on a cupboard or cabinet, but it's, you know, similar to, because it's just locking up the, mm -hmm. the stairs to the attic, so. Well, the, yeah, the, go, no, um, the stairs are here from 1840s. 18, so that includes mm -hmm. this. Includes the door, right. Yeah, it just, it's these, these couple stairs and the, the cut through of the doorway and into that bedroom. they cut the bottom of the door to make this then. Actually, they, they added this in, because if you, you come out here, yeah, you, you see, here's the bottom step, 
you know, and it's hidden by this being right. added in and then, yeah, them cutting the door off and, and putting it right in there. Cool. That's why you have that board that you're standing on. Yep. Right. But, yeah, you know, I, I was reading it as though they probably did this, you know, in, in the, probably in the 50 era, 1950s, when they do so much other work here. Right. But based on the nails in this board, it looks like, no, it was done in the late 19th century. Mm. She said there used to be a sink in this corner. That's, it's actually not unusual, in the, like in the late 19th and into the early 20th century, to find sinks getting put into individual bedrooms. Yes. In fact, there's a, there, um, the Howard County, or no, the, the Carroll County Historical Society, they're, they still have a sink from the late 19th century in one of the bedrooms upstairs, and it just, the, it, it pipes right through the wall, and it just ran out the side of the wall, out the, the house, you know. It didn't go any further than outside the wall. Um, and it, they could have very well done that here as well. Because yeah. she said when she, when they first bought the house in the 20s, they all lived downstairs because of the heat. They, mm. you know, they didn't live up here. And this was her father. That her father had a train garden up here <laughs> in the 40s. And eventually she and her sister shared this room as a bedroom. But, and then they had that makeshift closet here that they removed when they put in the HVAC. Oh, bag. yes, I was gonna say, cause that shows on my plan. I glanced at the plan and I was like, oh, I remember. You know, and I'm assuming that closet gets put in because they lose that closet when yeah. they cut that through. I, and I, it'd be interesting, but unfortunately, it's, now that it's gone, there's no way to know what, what date that closet was. But then here you are again, you're correct, because here's the cutout. Right, there's the, well, it's, it's actually not a cutout, it's just actually just the paint line, you know, because the lock is, is put on the raw wood, then the wood gets painted okay. of the door, and, you know, and so this is just a buildup of the paint along there okay. is all you're looking at. And the keyhole, is that, that's for the carpenter that's lock? That's probably for the carpenter lock, yeah. Because okay. it obviously doesn't work on this at all. So it's probably just left over from there. Very cool. Yeah, and we could, we could measure out the carpenter locks downstairs and probably, yeah. Yeah. it would probably be right there. Yeah, and then you can, uh, yeah, you can see, now there is where it's been cut out and patched, where the, the lip of the carpenter lock wraps around the door, mm -hmm. so you can see that right there. They had to fill that in when they pulled the lock off. Okay, so right. now we still have a carpenter lock on this door. Yeah, but is it, it's not, well, it is, yeah. What's that, what were you looking for? Well, I, I, was, I was looking for the seal here, the, you know, it, this little seal says Carpenter and Company Patentees, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then just, yeah, that, that lines up, and that's basically where that uh, keyhole was on that other door. The inter oh, yeah, so, and then you can see, they've, they've painted it that kind of disguises it, but you can see that the, the edge continues over here, and that's where it's screwed into the door here. The lock itself, yeah. So th yeah, this is the part of the metal plate of the lock here, gotcha. oh, and the, and the and there's the screws, yeah. So that's we can say that's original door to 1840 with the original yep. lock. Yep. Original lock, original brass knobs. Yep. And they painted the night latch, so it can't, it doesn't operate anymore. But you've got that little little piece on the yes. bottom that slides and there's that bar. So it's brass. So, well, the knobs are brass. This is all cast iron here. Okay. Um, so it's probably only the knobs that are brass. This little knob could be brass as well. Um, I'm trying to remember whether these are brass in the carpenter lock. Sometimes the, you know, the bolts will be brass. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they are in the carpenter locks. So as I recall, they, they're iron. Okay, so we have an original 1840 door. That door was added sometime later. Yeah, the trim is obviously different. Connect them. Yeah, when they, when they, the yeah, because it gets, it gets a closet into here. This yeah. room didn't have a closet, so 
when they do that, they create closet for this room as well. Yeah. And this is probably, you know, 20s actually, that lock. So this is a mortise lock, gotcha. you know. And so that, that hole that's cut in there is a mortise, just like the, the doors have a mortise and tenon joined. Yeah. It's that same thing. It's a pocket cut in the, into the... Because it looks like the windows can be propped out, so I'm assuming mm -hmm. that's for cross-ventilation purposes. For heat? Yeah, it's, heat. It's, it's probably for cross-ventilation, right, to get air through so you can have the door closed and locked and still have some air coming right. through. So you have the privacy, um, you have the yeah. But also for getting light into the hallway because... You know, we have, we, we don't have a window here. We, I mean, we have that window over there, but, you know, this little corner could be a little bit dark. You know, it's nice that they did it on this one because you have the window at the end there. You know, and, and you know, this is a, a curious little feature. What exactly is right. this for, you know? I've seen this this would have worked well for a, um, for a, a bathroom you know, except that in the water you'd expect to be, you know, in the attic at the wing and not at this end, you know, but they, you know, if they, if they didn't, weren't plumbing it, then, I'm, you know, you could have easily used that with a closed stool or something at this end. You know, it's interesting that there's, they put a window in this little room. Um, Is it for symmetry outside? But if you... It, 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 it could be, but there's nothing below, mm -hmm. so you, you didn't have to put one, you know, you'd have had symmetry, since this is in the middle, you'd have had symmetry if you had blank wall there with a window at each end. Okay. So, you know, it, it's, it's there really for function. They needed light and air in that room for some reason, um, which strikes me as more than just storage. They, it, I'm wondering if they, they might have used it as some kind of, yeah, a wash room like that. A bathroom they could have had, you know, Interesting. for night soil and whatnot. Yeah. Let's see these hinges. Yes, yeah, these are different. I think, I think it's in Philadelphia. I think these are the, the William H. Carr hinges from Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, see, this is one that I cleaned off so that you could read it right there. Oh, wow. Okay. So it, the, it's a, I think it's a small W, M, H, car. See, these are grand rooms with the triple windows to them. The, you know, the triple window, the... The soonest I've seen a triple window used here is about 1810, and it's not very common. It's not until the 1820s that they sort of become common, and you can find them up into the 1850s. Um, so this would have been s still fairly stylish in the 1840s. Expensive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Look at the size of that. I mean, the sash, that's a, impressive. And then the mutton profile that they use here is this kind of a gothic profile, how it comes to a point. So it's almost like a lancet window profile to it. Oh, okay. Start to see this coming in in the 1830s. So it becomes kind of, you know, the style for your window sash mutton profile in the 1840s. And you still see it into the 50s. Sometimes in, you know, sort of like out in, out in the country, you'll, they'll still be using it into the early 60s. Mm. But, you know, for most people, this is out of, you know, by the 1860s, that's just out of, completely out of style. But for the 40s, it's right there. I'm wondering if this is redone somehow. Because they definitely took these out. We've got new brads here. They had they pulled out the yeah. Because this is all new putty. They re -putty, They took out these windows and re them recently and put them back in. 
and it looks like they did something to the jam that either covered over or totally replaced it. And the pulleys are either hidden or lost. Because well, these don't have these don't have the groove, but that one. Yeah, this one's clearly got the groove for the cord to go down into it. They call it a plow. They go, they've just cut the sash for the cord to go in smooth. So that and that is unusual for the 1840s. I don't know Later? That. You, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Possibly. There's nothing that other than that that makes me think that it would be later. It's just that kind of simple bevel in that bracket is just not something I've seen in the 40s. There's a stovepipe hole. There's a thimble there. That's where you typically see it. You know, the pipe's coming up and then over it, cut through into the flue. But here they must have had it, one coming right off the back. Um, usually you just see it run in, no infill like this. It just runs in and then they turn it up into the chimney flue. Yeah, there's a good question. That I don't know that we'd have any way to answer. You know, when did they switch over to stoves here. Because I know Sibylla told me that and the first thing her father did when they moved in was seal up all the chimneys. Mm -hmm. um, and she was born in this room. Gordon Smith tied a rope around his son and lowered him into the chimneys to undo the flues. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But let me see what, what kind of fireplace is in here. Well, the, this one is similar. It's the same one. Mm -hmm. Is it? Same thing? Yeah. And I don't know why you replace them unless you were replacing them with something much fancier than this. And there are still two upstairs. This one's the same too. And then we've got another one back here, right? Yes. <clears throat> and it's the same as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, they're they're different. It's interesting because this, you know, he uses all of these craftsmen from Baltimore, but this looks like something that a local guy is putting together. You know, obviously all the marble mantles downstairs are all coming from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. You know, but you wonder about those, and I forget now the records whether they suggest. It's, it's, it's not a 20th century, um, you know, if, if you were putting them in in the 20th century, they'd typically be doing a colonial revival, you know, stock thing that would have looked more like the one in the hallway downstairs, yeah. the passage. I'm leaning towards they must be original 1840s, yeah. It's just that this, is unusual. This you typically see a little bit later. Um, I just I'm, don't see them getting replaced in the 1870s with that. You know, <clears throat> there's one thing that <clears throat> in the 30s, 40s, 50s period, you do get these real blocky mantles, um, wood mantles, and I've always interpreted it as they're, they're done that way because they were marbleized from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so to make it believable that it's a nice marble mantle, you can't have real fine carving because the marble mantles typically didn't, you know. You, they're, they're typically sure. big blocky chunks of stone, you know. And this would look more like big blocky chunks of stone, you know. It'd be interesting to do paint analysis on this and find out 
I mean, you, you'd find out a couple things. You could, you could date it, you know, because of the pigments used, and you could determine whether it was marbleized originally um, as well. Original Greek temples and Roman temples were all polychromed, you know, and then that, you know, colonial Americans loved color and painted all kinds of garish colors and things and mixed patterns and all. But, you know, th you know the best way we could actually do that is just do a, a chromochronology, you know, somewhere on here, get the, the paint layers and compare it to this. You know, if the paint layers all, uh, you know, line up, mm -hmm. then you know that they're of the same period, you know. If, if you've got ten layers of paint here and only five layers, the, the top five are here, then you know for sure that that got redone at some point. You know, it'd be interesting to do a full paint analysis on this to determine whether it was marbleized from the beginning, um, but, but also, and, and that would answer the question of the date of that comparative to the, the rest of the woodwork in the room, but also, you know, you could, you can do a quick um, paint check. I mean, you know, I can do that on the two, you know, half an hour or whatever and be able to compare the, the paint layers to be able to figure out whether, whether we have the same number of layers and the colors line up and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I would assume that all of the mantles were done the same way. Yeah, it, because the baseboards what could very well also have been marbleized. Yeah, and you know, they, they were marbleizing. And downstairs, all of that, that real wide architrave around the doors, you know, with the, the sort of pedimented centers to it, that all looks like it would have been marbleized. I'm sure from the beginning they were marbleizing that as well as the base. And floor. where is that? Throughout the, the, the rooms of the main block of the house, yeah, on the first floor. Yeah. If you have someone who's into the colonial period and wants to take this house back and is willing to go to the trouble of taking off locks and moving them downstairs and, you know, to make it more colonial, they might look at that marbleizing and go, that's so Victorian, <laughs> you know. Let's, let's paint it white like we know the, it was in the 18th century here. From everybody that I interviewed, uh, nobody used the third floor hmm. except my family because he, my great-grandfather used to keep pigeons <clears throat> in one of the rooms up there. <clears throat> but... Um, all Sevilla said was that they used to come up here once a year to clean it, and that was it. Mm. Huh. Where is this coming from? Because that's first story trim. This is the, the, you know, the big wide stuff that I said I assumed would have been marbleized from the beginning. You know, that, this nice wide molding like that mm -hmm. um, would look perfect in stone. So... I would think that would have been marbleized. This lath is all, this is a 20th century. Those are all wire nails here. Most of the early lath that we have in this house is um, hand split. Did the ceiling go at an earlier date and get all replaced, relath and plastered, or was this not finished originally and then sometime probably early 20th century, they come back and finish it. Yeah. That sash looks new, actually, so I haven't gotten... No, it's pinned. It's in awfully good condition, but they took it out, and they, yeah, this has been reputtied, so, yeah, they pulled this out and redid it. That's, they must have stripped paint off of it, and that's why it looks so clean, and then they freshly painted it, so it, it looks quite new, but it's not. Um. But this would have been on the first floor, right? It wouldn't have been in the basement right. or anything because right. of the... Yeah, and only in the, the best rooms on the first floor, not in the service area. Would that be for a door, door. handle? Yeah, well... I was thinking the strike plate for a lock mm -hmm. would have been there. Now this nail 
is a wire nail coming through this, this piece of the, so, and that is two. So either it got pulled off and reattached somewhere else, or somebody copied the uh, early trim for a, a later, a later. Well, it, I, I, I don't know. At this point, <clears throat> I think it could go either way. It's interesting. It's all cut from a solid piece, plane down. It's not uh, applied moldings. Mm -hmm. would have expected these moldings to be applied. I don't know that we can get a look at the other stuff to see. I don't remember seeing anything missing, but then again, if it was all off, you wouldn't have noticed. Mm -hmm. I do know that the other room, the floorboards were all ripped up. Mm. Yeah, this is all so. new. They, what know, happened to the old? They must have just it broken all, it up. It was like some uh, somebody was trying to get to something underneath. Mm. You know, they just and, must have splintered the. F they didn't bother to take care to. Let's see. Here's this is your what your real standard stock Greek revival. You know, 1830s and 40s mantle. Mm -hmm. um, so is this like a servant's quarters? Put well, that possibly. Um, it's interesting that the, that that you have it heated though. I you know I'm oh, really? thinking yeah this is more these are more designed for fam as family spaces potentially. Oh, okay. Um, you know when you're thinking of, the, of this as a a you know summer house, mm -hmm. um, are you going to be bothering to put a fireplace in for servants and slaves? Um, probably not because you're not going to be here in generally in cold weather and okay. you're not treating them that well. Well, yeah, because this may be part of where they're getting some of the locks from because they didn't take all the locks on the second floor. Yes. So they're taking them from here and moving them down as well and not even bothering to replace them because they're probably not using this. Ah, oh, look at that. <coughs> look at the, grain, the graining on that door. Isn't that nice? So that's an so, 1840s door? Mm-hmm. 1840s door and finish. Yeah, so then this is painted to look like a strip of inlay. You know. It's like a mahogany with a with a satin wood inlay, something like that. Just on the pine door. Very nice. So all of that is just paint. And again, you have this makeshift closet. Mm-hmm. With the chimney flue that's crashing through that they put in later. <clears throat> you wouldn't expect up here for this door to be faux finished. Yeah. So di it, does this door get moved from somewhere else to up here? I mean, they, they, the hinges, they've clearly scraped the paint out of the screws in order to unhook it and yeah because this side they didn't even finish the wall here it's never been lathed and plastered in here so yeah you're looking at the wall the way the carpenter saw it when he left the job 1840 mm -hmm. 1840 well actually hang on a second maybe not because it's plastered behind, and that might be explaining what's going on here. So it's plastered behind, so this is added in later. This is open originally. So it wasn't a door here. It either. wasn't a door here. They add this wall in later, but it is cut nails, so it's 19th century. They want to make this a closet, some kind of a storage closet, I, I guess, and so they come in and add all this framing and then they take this door from who knows where 
you know, it may not have even gone to the house because the other doors, yeah, these work. This, they're identical. The hinges don't seem to be marked. So this comes from some other location. That has its door. Now, you, ah, there, you can see the graining shining through the, early, the later gray paint. Okay, I see it. Isn't that great? So all of these doors up here were grained. So what's that mean? Just, the, I mean, I mean, well, they're, they're going to the trouble. Um, we have fireplaces in these rooms and we have graining, so this so is family are, space. This family isn't, space. Yeah, it's, it's not a servant's space. That's just the wood showing through there. The thing is, you expect to see it here as well. Yeah, you can see it here too. So it's probably faint evidence of a slightly different graining pattern. Yep, it's here too. For, for this side of the door as well. Okay. Now you really need to hire a paint expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is it. Yep, it's here as well. Huh. Yeah. Get somebody to strip strip a, all the paint, all, that later paint off of a door and get back to the original. See the, you know, expose like just at least a section of the original finish to sure. be able to see it would be very cool. So they must have had rot in the dormers that took off the, the end of the joist and the header. And they replaced it all. You can see the brick here being exposed. Yeah. So we know this is the real uh, an original wall, right? Or, or at least up to here. But there, you, you can see the exposed brick, and I have them right here. You can see exposed brick. And in my estimation was, I think, from looking on the back, that about f you know five feet, at least at the bottom, five feet of the wall was, you know, still 18th century wall, you know. So, there, you know, he turned the corner and there was a little, you know, something like so that. Probably going up. something like this yeah, survived and right. was built. It's amazing <clears throat> he chose to do that and just knock it down. Yeah. And of course, these doors are not 1840s. This is 19, probably 19. But they have had stuff. solid doors then? Yeah. But the, the porch itself, did exist in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. It didn't. It didn't wrap around. Okay. It was. They were separate porches. So there's a front porch. There's a side porch, and then there's also, okay. most likely, a back porch. But when I had looked at the porch under there, everything had been replaced. So there, you know, there had to be a porch, obviously, because you've got that door there. There had to be something back there. Well, but if you look at this <coughs> photo, this is taken out back here. Okay. There's no porch. There's no porch. It's but already. A door. Yep. See the door. It's already There's no ports there. been removed. Yes. Isn't so, that interesting? Curious to see if we have evidence. Oh, you're looking for those lines? Yeah. There's something right there. See the double line there? Got a, I see it. Yeah, it runs up. And then it kind of disappears here under paint. So do you paint. think they would have been exposed wood, or do you think it would have been painted? It would have been painted painted to look like a better wood than, okay. than the pine that it actually is. So okay. painted to look like um, probably mahogany or some other. And, and you know, based on that, maybe also with an inlay of something like satin. Not jumping out. And yeah, I'm not seeing it either. Because probably just because of the more layers of paint than you had in the attic, you know, that one door that only had one layer of gray. It's interesting that they're using three sets of hinges on these doors. Mm -hmm. 
you know, typically you're only using two. Mm -hmm. About the only place you see three would be on the exterior, like the front door. Okay. Um, but these, the weight th of the door? I think it's the weight of the door, okay. you know. And even though two might have been sufficient, You've got money. You can afford to add a third hinge in there, and then you know that door's going to, yeah, yeah the, that door's not going anywhere. It's going to be good and strong. That's the only one that I have of the interior. Okay, that's, that's, and I that's, think it was taken uh -huh. right here. Well, you know what that shows. You can tell that there is no carpenter lock there, because oh, gotcha. it yeah. would be it, it's up here. Yep. You'd see. It, and you can see, I believe, I believe you see, I think that's the, the lock escutcheon, the keyhole escutcheon right there, which would be... Painted over, or... Um, let's see, he's standing at about right here, so the shoulder... It's, it could be under the lock, let's see. Well, if they were grained, it looks to me like they've been painted over by the time of this photo so that they weren't grained anymore. Well, this is interesting. Assuming this is taken where we've seen the, the brick yeah. exposed before because it looked like in that other photo, but here, that stone, stone mm -hmm. and this is the wing. Mm -hmm. So maybe he rebuilds that the top of the wing in stone because the bottom is already in stone anyway. It's possible. But in, in order for it to be in the back, that would say the main block would have to have stone. These eye hooks, are they for a... Uh, I was told that you put bars on them and you roll the whiskey. That's, that's what I believe, yes, that they were for sliding or rolling, gently rolling barrels down these steps. So now we're getting back, we're in the 18th century? We are in the 18th century foundation. Okay. Yeah, and you know, it's just amazing that we have this depth, you know, that they excavated, yeah, the, the cellar this deep. Um, yeah, just absolutely amazing. D. Smith told me, and this was still in 19, yeah, I think the 1950s, is that there was a whip, there, they called it the whipping post, that stood right here and went up to the ceiling. And from it hung chains with shackles on them. So she said she used to look for dry blood and her brother would dig in the basement looking for buried treasure and stuff. But she does remember that. And another person said when he came down here, he remembers on the wall, not chains, but metal like restraints. Like you could see it was for a collar and for hands. It was like a bar. He said, but they weren't shackles or chains. The arches get right. smaller. Right. I, I, Do you remember that? I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had to, Have you ever seen I looked before? through my write up and had noticed yeah, those smaller, the, the note of the smaller arches. In my write-up, I noted that um, Tom Reinhardt and Marsha Miller at the Trust mm -hmm. had said that there are similar arches like this in the basement of Mount Airy, an 18th century house which burns in like the 1840s and is, you know, rebuilt. rebuilt. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, is this connected to rebuilding after the fire. Um, the arches, yeah. And is it in part to strengthen the wall or is this simply to, to give support for the fireplaces above? And, and, and typically, typically, you know, when you have a fireplace, you're gonna carry a couple of piers down, you know, below to support it. So, you know, you generally would do that and you might, in a, you know, in a more refined way, mm -hmm. do an arch to help support all that weight. But that doesn't explain why you do, say, this arch here. Or the sizes mm -hmm. is what, I, what, I, what struck it, me. That well, I mean, the, si the size could vary based on the, the size of the fireplace above, okay. you know. So you have a fireplace here, so it makes 
sense to have this peer here and it would make sense to have a peer over there but you know this this arch in a sense doesn't make any sense to me why it, why it would be there because you d you don't have a fireplace above there so you have no you know this pier could have gone straight up so this suggests that yeah they want to strengthen the connection between wall and 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 back wall here the arches seem to be 1840 I mean even the store when you look at it yeah got great strap hinges to it real wall so what is that date to well, the strap hinges are, <clears throat> um, you know, you could find them in the 18th century, uh, you know, all over the place, but they're still using them throughout the 19th century. You can find them being used on barns built in the early 20th century. So, um, unfortunately, they don't tell us a whole lot in and of themselves. Now, do you think and, this room would <coughs> have been divided in uh, 18th century? Let's see. We have a frame wall above. There's we got joists running from end wall to that partition wall. So there's no reason to have this wall here based on the current construction, mm -hmm. which would make me think that the wall predates the 1840s, so it's probably an 18th century wall, you know, and then the, the possibility is down here, you know, that frame could be part of the 18th century. Because it looks like they that one time put the door on, you know, they, how they block, had to block it out. Yeah, the, the thing is, I, I was just noticing it in the, in the book that his um, 1840s expenses he, he mentions like three cellar locks, okay. you know, so at least the, you know, there would have been locks on these doors in the 18th century, so the locks apparently didn't survive, suggesting the doors didn't survive, so it may also be the frames burned at least enough that uh, they felt they needed to replace them because there was clearly a lock on that door. You know, that's what this is for. You know, you could have a lock on the inside with a, you know, a slide bolt to it, mm -hmm. and then you'd have a, you know, just like a wood peg coming through the door, mm -hmm. but you have to have a hole, you know, like a channel cut across this way so that you can slide it. So when you pull the door to, you slide it over, and that bolt slides into here. But that, th this isn't set Why up is for that. such an odd cutout? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. So makeshift. Usually, the locks that you find in the basement, although that, the lock is up here. I, I'm not sure what, let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. Because the locks in the basement are often what's called a stock lock. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm assuming when he said cellar locks, that's what he's referring to. So it would be a, the, the, case would instead of being cast iron like in the carpenter locks it would be wood okay. then the it it's hollowed out on the back side and you have the metal you know the the metal f you know, um, I'm gonna say fittings but you know the metal parts of the lock that operate you know the slide bolt and everything that all that is metal and is inside so it's just cased in wood and then screwed onto here. And that's what, it must have been on this side, and that's why that's cut out, and that's what this is for, so that it would have locked into there. Okay. So, you know, you can, you can just barely see where the lock was, and it's presumably, that's where it was attached. Okay. And then we could, that could be, could this be, Hole four, nope, it doesn't go through that, unless this is added on later, and I don't think it is. So it may have only locked, they didn't need to lock it from the inside, they must have sure. just lo worked it from the outside. So what this is, I don't know at this point. 
Let's see how it lines up here. Yeah, that's got to be that's got to be related to this. And it I'm thinking this is an earlier. That's interesting. So you think this one existed in the golf era? Yeah. Now, this is interesting. You know, we were looking at <clears throat> the attic framing was all hewn. Yes. But this this wood lintel was sawn. And you, you see the, the end here where it's rough? Yep. When you, when you put it into the saw mill, they, they don't saw all the way through. They saw gotcha. short okay. of the end so that it holds together to a certain extent. And then when you pull them out, you break it off. And that, that's, why that, it that's why it's, yeah, it leaves that rough edge to it. You know, we do have the brick at the edge, like you had mentioned before, yeah, given the, the, the hard the edge. Stone. Yeah, the hard edge to the, the stonework. So um, they may have cut this through and then put brick at the edge to finish it off and stuck that in. If you're on a water powered saw mill, uh -huh. right, so you have a reciprocating saw, it's going up and down. Okay and you're running it through, they do that. But they also do that if they are pit sawing. So by hand, yeah. you know, one guy top, one guy bottom, yeah. cutting it and then breaking it off. You could potentially see pit sawing here in the 18th century. Okay. There are, you know, by, by 1760, there are sawmills all over this area, you know. So, um, but but you could still sometimes see some pit sawing being done. You know, 1840, no pit sawing at all. It all is going to be done on a water-powered mill. Okay. Um, so, you know, I would expect that this would be from a water-powered mill, and then, you know, in a sense that in, the, in a sense that doesn't help you because mm -hmm. it could be 1760s, it could be 1840s. Okay. If it's pit sawing, it can't be 1840s realistically. And do you think this basement would have extended over <coughs> to the, into the wing? Most likely, yes. It costs money to excavate, especially, especially when you're excavating this deeply. So um, there are plenty of instances of houses with just crawl spaces under a portion of the house. That may, you know, that may be why he builds just to this wall to start with anyway, okay. because the yeah, he's going to use the existing basement. And then again, here's the fireplace, and you can see an arch. Yeah, a little relieving arch. But this is all added. I think it's done in the 20th century. 20th century. I think if we look at the other fireplace headers, mm -hmm. you'll see that they have, typically they'd have a through tenon and then there'll be an exposed peg on the side. Mm -hmm. And we don't even have a through ten in here at all. Let me quick check. And what's a through ten in? <coughs> well, let's see if we've got it right here. So the, the fireplace header, they've doubled it up. Yeah. Each one has a, a tenon coming through. So they've cut the mortise in this joist all the way through, and it, it comes through you know, extends, what, nine inches past the joist. Okay. And then they have this wedge, this face wedge coming through, and that wedge tightens it and keeps it from pulling out. And it's just wood? Mm-hmm. Jeez. You don't have to use any nails. It's amazing. It's survived. The moisture and everything down it, here? It part, of, part of the reason is, yeah, well, but you, the, you know, here you have such a high, okay. you know, space that, um, yeah, the moisture content of the air is pretty high down here, but it, as it goes up, and of course, created a bad situation because we put glass in the windows, mm -hmm. and, you know, in the summertime, you wouldn't have those closed off at all. In the winter, yeah, you might close them off, mm -hmm. but, you know, you've got a lot less humidity at that time, so you have less issues. But you'd have great ventilation if those were open, and that's why the bars are there, so nobody breaks in to steal your food stored down here. 
So it's hidden by the new conduit, mm -hmm. but you see the, the piece of metal that's coming out behind the conduit? That's, that's one of the call bell cranks. There's the other one coming on in the wall there. What this is suggesting to me is the, the call bell wire came down through the floor to here. Okay. Was attached at one end, this end, and then probably then it, it's attached at that end and it comes over to here where it probably, this, this one is then turning it and the wire's coming down so what would they so, have been doing down here, do you think? I mean, that the, well, that there's a call bell. <clears throat> it's the call, the, the, the crank is for up in the room above, right? Okay. So, so someone up above is turning it. Yeah. And, the, and it's, you know, the, that turn is just moving the wire along the, the whole path. Yeah. The wire is presumably going over to the kitchen area where the call oh, bells okay. would actually okay. be. Okay. So someone in the kitchen is hearing that ring and going, oh, someone, someone in the okay. parlor needs me or someone in okay. the dining room. Or because there's still a pulley system in place right there. You can see the pulley. Yeah. Um, and over here they found the well, but when we started going down there, we, we, we found broken bottles and, and hmm. stuff from, uh, from that period. Hmm. We said 20th century, would stone been a common to use to support a fireplace? Yeah, there's the main reason for doing it here is because of the moisture level. Yeah. The brick get if the brick's getting wet, it's you know going to deteriorate, okay. so, so stone. stone makes more sense. And then if, when you look up, you're looking up um, not at the bottom of the floor. Yeah. You're looking at the bottom of the the um, counter ceiling that's installed. Okay. When they when they're building the house, they're putting those basically furring strips along the joists, uh -huh. and then setting these boards in on top of them, and then they are packing that clay layer on top of the boards. Okay. You know, so it's going in wet, and you can push it all the way up to the sides of the joists. Okay. Well, except now this is just a handle. Because the slot would be on this side, because the door, the the door, yeah, you pull the door closed, but you'd have to you'd have to have a the the little, you or you'd either have a, and you know that's how that has to have worked. It had to have been a key that moved a, a bolt over. Yeah, this this door has is beaded boards. Just, just that they went to the trouble of, you know, running, you know, so he had a, his beading plane and he ran it along the edge of all the boards to cut that little detail in mm -hmm. just for your cellar door. You know, instead of just having straight butted boards, you go ahead and you cut beads on it because so that's what a craftsman, looks, yeah, that's, okay. mm -hmm, that's what a craftsman does. He wants to make it look better, so. He's going okay. he's gonna to cut those on. It must have been a key. There had to have been like a wood stock lock here, and they had a key with a bolt that went into that. Rather than, because it doesn't work as a, you know, just, <coughs> you'd have a wooden slide bolt mm -hmm. with a wood pin in it, but you have to have the hole going this way so you can slide it across. And then on this side, you would have something like this that it would slide into. You'd have two of these that it would slide into. But this is done as a handle to pull the door closed. And you know, those heads are awfully rusted, but they, they look more wrought than cut. So they might... The strange thing here is, you know, that frame is set, those frames are set into the wall. Mm -hmm. This one's not. It's yeah. set, it's like this could have been picked up from anywhere and moved here. And I don't know why you wouldn't set it into the wall because it, when this is closed and locked, what's keeping anybody from, well, first from pushing it over or just climbing over. So this part is, eight, you think, uh, 18th century? 
I guess it, it pretty much has to be because that's the only way into the cellar. You know, we get to this question of how did the, the original building change over time because it looks like we have brick house for the main block yeah. but, but stone for the wing. So is the stone, is the stone wing added later? The wings are there in the the paintings, right? Yeah. So what? So we have probably, you know, there was some kind of an area way to get down to this originally, and then it get it gets subsumed within the wing when the wing gets added. Mm -hmm. um, but they would have had to have had this basement here because it's the only your only way into that the main cellar area. Here's your elbow latch. Any reason for the double doors? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I remember reading that in my write-up and very curious as to what's going on with that. Unless you had one door at one time, uh, then <laughs> maybe they wanted to protect this door and they added another exterior door? Maybe. Originally you wouldn't have had the window in there, yeah. so they cut the window in but then they, you eliminate the use of the window by putting the second door. That door looks like a 20th century wood door. It doesn't look that old from here. Yeah. Slide bolts and whatnot, did they? So that, yeah, that's for a, a, like a Suffolk latch on the outside. But that wouldn't work with this. This can only be opened from the inside. And then you padlock that. They keep adding things. But the door's old, we know, because of the, the beating and the... It's wrought nails holding it together now. You know, the wrought nails are typically 18th century, mm -hmm. but not in doors. They're still, they're still using wrought nails in doors throughout much of the 19th century um, because, you know, they're driving the nail through and then they're clinching it, bending it over at the mm -hmm. end, and cut nails um, tend to snap off when you clinch them. Yeah. So they continue to use wrought nails which wouldn't snap off when they're doing doors with battens and whatnot. So uh, Unless <coughs> you said that's a 20th century door on the outside? Uh, it, that's what it was so looking maybe like I'm through thinking the glass. He wants to preserve this the, door, the old door. The, the old door. Yeah. And he put that door on there as like a screen door basically. Yeah, that may be. This window is pinned together. You know, this is a pattern that you're seeing like in the 1880s and 90s, mm -hmm. Queen Anne stuff. But a lot of times you're not seeing those window sash pinned together. So this could be something earlier than that. Um, But it could have, you know, they could have found it from an old house somewhere and mm -hmm. brought it in and cut it into the door. So what yeah. do you think that? What would you? Well, what's your you estimation know, on that? I guess the door. While I can't say it's not 18th century, it's probably 1840s for the door, and then this is probably added in in the period 1875 to 1900, so, you know, fourth quarter of the 19th century. I'm just thinking maybe light, I don't know. That's it. You know? Mm-hmm. Although, I mean, you've got light there, and then, the, you know, we have these matching windows here, which is interesting. But those hinges, no, that's a cut nail. So that's a 19th century nail that was holding it in place. Those look more like round heads of wire nails. It's interesting, I'm not seeing pin there. I'm not seeing a pin up there. Let's see if there's... I'm not seeing a pin there. So that, that sash is pinned together at the corners, but this one is n not, apparently. That's a little wire sprig. I mean, it could still be late 19th century because they were available then. Um, and that one is too, but it suggests we have two different eras for, 
for those two windows, even though they, you know, have the diamond lights that, mm -hmm. you know, tie them together. And presumably, this is the window frame. Do we have it there? Yeah, it's pretty much surviving there. I, we don't, you can't see the pins. I don't think you can. But it looks like it's probably the same. This one's just rotted, and that's the only piece left of the original frame. Actually, that may not be pinned. That's a knot. It was just nailed. Oh, OK. And then we have riven lath on the window yeah, soffit. soffit. Yeah, and right. you can see it in that wall, too. You know, it may be the curve as well. It's, at this point, we can't say. But certainly, the wall is good for 1840. The hand split lath is basically getting used up to about 1850. Okay. But it starts getting replaced about 1835 with saw and lath. Circular saws come in. Mm -hmm. they, they can be found in places earlier than 1835, but not much around here. It, it seems that about 1835 is when they start cutting up material with circular saws. And what they're cutting is small stuff. Okay. Shingles for wood roofs and then plaster lath. Okay. And um, so then this period from like 1835 to 1850, mm -hmm. you have this overlap of the two technologies getting used. So okay. you, you know, um, when Peter Perry and I worked on the Pratt House, mm -hmm. most of the house, which is 1846, 47, most of the house had sawn plaster lath, but down in the basement they were still using the earlier riven lath because okay. it was the service space. So they were using the, the l sort of lesser material down there even though you would never see it. Okay. You know. Um, so, you know, that's that overlap. <clears throat> so, you know, you see this and, you know, basically it's before 1850. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's a cut nail head. So it's not, this isn't an 18th century nail. So this is, is to the old house. Mm -hmm. This this is eighteen to the original house. Well, to the 1840, 1840 house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are these are this is a cut nail. It's a nineteenth century nail, okay. not a wrought nail. Okay. So when when the house when this wing is originally constructed, if there was a wall down here, it w you know that was plastered, it would have had the riven lath like this, but it would have had wrought nails, not okay. cut nails. Gotcha. So then it it you know so that. You know, works with the whole rest of the history of the house. So this wall gets put in in 1840 when he first does this. Yeah, and then here we have graining on this door, but this is later graining. So this is like a late 19th century pattern of graining. So it, you know, this is this is like you'd see in in the 1875 to 1910 period. Okay. Um, you know, I, I've always interpreted this as they're doing oak. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, oak furniture becomes popular like in the okay. 1890s, early 1900s, and that might be why they're graining this door to look like that. Now the question is, is this, see, this is pinned. This is the six panels. It makes you think this door came from elsewhere, though, because why would you have grained it for the inside of this little closet here. Here's a wall. But did they curve walls like that or mm -hmm. they did? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, if you if you're thinking about for example how this is functioning, mm -hmm. you've got somebody bringing in large stuff down that big wide doorway, okay. you know. And they're they want to go to that one. Mm -hmm. If, if this wall comes out to here, how often is he going to clip that corner of that wall gotcha. and screw it up? You know, there's your plaster job. You know, so you, you curve it and it has a lot more chance of surviving mm -hmm. getting stuff into there. And then this is just an entrance to the kitchen then, I'm assuming. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting that you have two different doorways here. Let's see. Of course, this this one. Oh, that's right. We, in looking at that brickwork, it mm -hmm. was looking like it was a nineteenth century add-in. Mm -hmm. 
and this is how you would typically do it. You know, you, you've got a pier on either side, and then but sometimes they'll do the arch, sometimes they'll just put in wood lintels across there to support everything above, you know. But you don't have arches to either side, mm -hmm. you know, because you don't need them. That's extra. Yeah. So, you know, to have an arch in that main block mm -hmm. in the center makes sense because it's supporting the fireplace above, but those other arches don't, aren't supporting anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And the stove, I mean, that's 1840s? <coughs> the fireplace is 18... Yeah, right. Well, yeah, so this, this jam, at least, is 1840s. And where do you... Okay, so what are you so identifying? The, the splay of the jam, the angle of the jam, you know, in... <coughs> in yeah, so 18th century fireplaces typically have straight jams, okay. you know. Um, you see, you see straight jams actually in um, some 19th century big kitchen fireplaces, like in in farmhouses, because they're they splay the jams. This is um, Count Rumford, who he's actually an American. Benjamin Thompson, he's a New Englander, and he goes he goes over to Europe mm -hmm. um, in the 18th century. Um, styles himself as Count Rumford. He works for a number of different um, kings in, you know, in parts of Germany and whatnot. Um, and one thing he does is he revolutionizes how fireplaces are built in order okay. to improve the, their, their heating and yeah. waste less wood for yeah. you know, the poor. And he publishes it for free for anybody to use so that you know, people who don't have money can heat their house more effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that he does is to splay the jams so that, you know, the heat is getting reflected off and out, you know, more out into okay. the room. Okay. Um, he also, he also, you know, rearranges the, th you know, the throat of the fireplace and starts to make them smaller and mm -hmm. narrower um, so that they draw better so the smoke goes up, mm -hmm. but um, and then they, he brings the throat in so it helps to throw the heat out instead of just all going straight up the chimney. Um, so the, the splay jam is telling me, yeah, this is actually 1840s because, of course, this could have survived from the 18th century, you know, yeah. down here. We're assuming but he had an outside kitchen, though. I do know that. He had a two-story outside kitchen. Okay. Would he have, <coughs> by any means, had an indoor well, in the, in the last quarter of the 18th century, they're starting to move some of the, some of the you know, sort of the wealthiest people mm -hmm. are starting to move towards indoor kitchens. Okay. Um, in the early 19th century, then you get this, you know, sort of a, this big wave of m most houses are getting built with an indoor kitchen, and sometimes they're connecting the outdoor kitchen mm -hmm. to the house via a wing okay. or a hyphen. See, I always so. thought they didn't do that because of the, the, the risk of fire. Well, you know, you know that, that's the story, and, you know, it certainly makes sense, but the reality is we have indoor kitchens, you know, like basement kitchens in the 18th century in places. Okay. Um, you know, in ur some urban contexts, you... you kind of stuck where you have to mm -hmm. fit it in somewhere and you know connected to the house um, it this is it's one of those things that you know I don't have good answers for mm -hmm. nobody does um, it's something that I've been wrestling with recently because um, it seems that the connections the connecting kitchens comes in before the use of cook stoves comes in, you know. Okay. And it, it would make sense if, oh, you're, you're putting your kitchen in because suddenly you no longer have an open fire, you have mm -hmm. a cook stove, and so the, the threat of fire is less. And that would make perfect sense, but reality doesn't seem to say that that's what's going on because they're, they're connecting these kitchens before they are using cook stoves. Okay. So in the 18th century, he could have. Mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> he could have had an um, 
an indoor kitchen as well as an outdoor one. Mm -hmm. um, plenty of farmhouses would have had both. Um, in, even in the 19th century, they're building an outdoor kitchen, so they're doing a lot of, you know, they're doing butchering, mm -hmm. laundry, a lot of stuff away from the house yes. to keep that heat away, even yeah. though if they're do cooking in the house. Um, you know, and of course we know that chimney up above mm -hmm. is 18th century chimney, yes. you know. So, now maybe it's just going to that fireplace, originally was just used that for that whatever fireplace or maybe two fireplaces up there. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a date, a, a good date for when this wing gets added to the house, right? No, I mean in the book it'll tell you when the paintings were made and the wings existed and then when he actually mm -hmm. made the purchase. Because he purchased that the house started construction in like 1774. Yeah, we don't have a date of when those wings were added, but we do know he is the one that added them. Right. And so, and that's right in the period where you know he could have decided the outdoor kitchen is you know it's just a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. I want an attached one, so that's why I'm building this wing is to create a kitchen in the basement here. Um, so that, I, you know, because w sort of my, one of my working theories for this is that, you know, dining becomes more and more of a civilized gentry thing, you know, so you're, you're showing off. Mm -hmm. How do you do that when your slaves are bringing the food from the kitchen and it's raining, you know, sure. or it's cold and snowing, you know, by the time you get the food here, it's not very appetizing when it hits the table, you know. Sure. So, how do we work around that? Well, we attach the kitchen because, you know, then the food gets here a lot quicker and a lot warmer and drier. And, you know, so... When did they do the dumb waiters? When, when did that come into play? Well, we certainly... Yeah, right, right, right. We certainly could have had an, a dumb waiter in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. Even, it, you know, even if it wasn't there when this wing gets added. Mm -hmm. So they beveled the beam, which is as much for fire retarding as it is actually for decoration. Okay. You know, because if, if you had a fire here, uh -huh. the first thing that catches is that little, the corners of the beam. Yeah. And then it'll spread. By beveling the beam, you know, you've, um, you know, the, the, the surface area to mass ratio of the beam, mm -hmm. you know, is, is such that the beam won't catch very quickly. The, only, the place where it catches is where there's a lot of surface area right at that corner. So, yeah, so the fire, you know, when they had fires, they're finding out that, yeah, it's that corner that's catching first, and then, you know, it just leads to the beam eventually going up. So that's why they're beveling. Yeah. It's nice they did a runoff there, you know. So it is decorative too, but mm -hmm. but it, there's a practical function to it. There was exposed foundation, I think, under this porch, you know. But here we have um, what's called galloting okay. in the stonework. Okay. So it's the little pebbles that are stuck into the mortar. Yep. Um, and I th think the on the other side we have it, but it's larger stones which is typically how you see it, not these small stones, you know. This is, you know, fascinating, curious that they did it. Maybe it's in the, in, it could be in the foundation work that they did the galloting. Anyway, it's an 18th century treatment. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's a decorative treatment. It was popular in the Annapolis area, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's not surprising to find it up here either. I mean, clearly the, the, the wing is added up to and against. The so did he building. raise this wing? Is that, this, would that stone have been, exp been there in the original construction at the bottom? Yeah. That stone would have been there. That, yeah, that's the stone foundation. So okay. you, you want to bring it up above, you know, above grade level and okay. then go with your brick. Because I can see the Flemish bond. Right. Like you were showing. Right. Okay. So that we could say that's an original wall? That looks like 18th century wall. Yeah. Yep. Because of the Flemish bond. And then you can see the damage. So, yeah. wow, it took the house. Mm hmm No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. 
and you're right, we're right where the wall is that takes you up to the attic. Mm -hmm. So that looks like the only thing that survived was that wall. And if you look at the other corner down there, it, that's all stone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, it, you know, but clearly when he puts the, when Guff puts the wing on, he's not thinking rough casting at that time because he's putting the, the expense into the galleting, yes. you know, to, okay. to be exposed. So the stone is exposed. Instead of building it in brick, that would have tied in, you know, to the rest of the house. Okay. He's building it in stone with, so this, with the galloting in the wall. This stone right here, because of the, the galloting, is original? Original, yeah, that's the, that's the, the wing edition oh, when, you know, for the, like, 1790s or whenever it's getting yeah, added okay. on. Yeah. So how far would that have gone up before you hit brick? Well, I don't think you would do. I think it's probably stone all the way up. Oh, really? Yeah. So it would have been a stone wing? I think so. Well, yeah, that the, in the picture you see the brick and then you see stone right at the edge and I'm thinking that, you know, now it's also at this level. So he, you know, that, yeah, when you get, you get this point, yeah, it's possible that it changes from the stone here and to, to brick at this point. Is there a reason why it's curved? In the 18th century, the house would have had a water table here. Um, and, you know, it's it's a combination of it's a design feature, and then it's also practical because water running down the wall this throws it off away from the foundation. Okay. You know, so it's it's both. Um, yeah, and and so you'd have it on the main block. It's not surprising that he would have done it here too, okay. and that is all, of course, now covered in the rough casting. Okay. So we don't know what it looked like because in the 18th century you would have expected the the basement to have you know that water table to have been molded okay. you know this is a grand enough house that uh -huh. it probably would have had a molded water table you know okay. curves to it instead of just an angle okay. there are a couple ways that he could have done it you know if this is a brick wall up here and then you're going to stone he could have put a brick here mm -hmm. like a just a beveled brick that would have made the water table. Or okay. he could have done it in, in a mortar. You know, I, I have seen a couple of examples where they did it just, they just put mortar up there and they beveled the mortar off so that water would run down the brick wall, hit the mortar, and then, and then come off away from the stone foundation or the brick foundation below. How far would this stone foundation have gone up to what we saw over there? Well, I would have thought that it would have been, they would have carried it up to just below the floor level, which makes sense there. So I was a little surprised to see it only carried up to here. <clears throat> you know, that's where you'd expect to see it if it was a small farmhouse, okay. you know, without a huge cellar like we have here. Um, and you, you know, you go two steps up and you're in the door. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is a grand, yeah. you know, it's really set up high, which helps in getting all that cellar headroom. Uh, that suggests to me that it was, it, it came down basically to the ground the fire took it took those walls down to the ground there for all intents and purposes yep. this is the carroll house you wonder if the steps originally came out here and there right but in the 1840s you know because they put those two doors you know would they have put steps yeah. off straight off the door or the or put it in the center the sad thing is you have these late 18th early 19th century paintings of the property yes. you know but then you don't have anything from say 1810 to about what 1875 18. when he rebuilds it why doesn't he have a painting done of it because they he put slate on the wing uh -huh. in 1840 and then he did standing seam metal on the main block in 1844, which is 
you know, it's interesting that he he changed materials, but you have to think this the slate was must have been coming from Cardiff Delta, and maybe he had trouble getting it, but he certainly was interested in, you know, he wasn't doing wood shingles, he wasn't going to run the risk of fire. He, you know, he was he was concerned about and he also fireproofing. Had a lot of light well, yeah, you no, know, it would be interesting to to <clears throat> do some probing over here. Can you find the old foundation walls? It's probably all within the fence line here, but they must have taken up a certain amount of stone just because they're doing a, you know, a yard here eventually. You know, how far down would you have to dig, say right here, till, till you hit stone and, you know, and then of, you know, how far down can you document, you know, till, till you hit undisturbed soil, you know, was there a, um, a cellar here as well? Because you've got a lot of debris there from the fire. They could have pushed all that debris from the fire the into the cellar here and filled it up and yep, covered it over. Because you got to think, the original house, not only do you have the wing, but then, then you, you have, have the chapel right. that came out this way. Right. There's that too, yep. And that likely didn't have a basement to it, yeah. but you'd still have foundation walls yeah. down there somewhere. Yeah, because there's got to be plenty of brick and probably some stone too that was just wasn't use, reusable. Mm -hmm. And so they push it into the hole if, you know, if there was a cellar here. It'd be the easiest way to deal with it. There was a barn that stood right over here, which I think was added later, not during the golf time, because it, it surely doesn't appear in the paintings, and I don't know why he would have a barn like that so close to the, right. the house. Um, Unless, I mean, the, the, the exception to that is if he had racehorses. There, there's a pattern, you can see it at Hampton Mansion. There, there are the barns for the workhorses and oxen and everything far away. The stable for the horses that you're really proud of, including your racehorses, that's up near the house. That's sitting out front where when you come up the drive, that's one of the first things you see. Yeah, so I wouldn't be a bit surprised that that <clears throat> to have a stable out where he could keep an eye on them and everyone coming would see them.